Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Irby Gill, and today I'm presenting evaluating XG boost as a baseline model for spatially informed uh, precipitation predictions. So I want to start off with some background here. Uh, the images on the left indicate why, some of the reasons why we need uh, to predict precipitation and importance of it. Uh, the pictures on the left, the top and bottom show some areas that will experience flooding. Uh, and on the right, we have uh, other areas that will experience extreme droughts. Uh, areas like uh, China and other developed cities, uh, including New York, are experiencing extreme, experience extreme flooding, which will impact a lot of different uh, infrastructure and societal um, practices and in economics, where other areas like uh, North Africa will experience extreme drought. Um, some of these developing nations depend on hydroelectricity for their development of, of electricity or for uh, development of power. And so um, with extreme flooding, which could disrupt um, the, the production of crops in India, or with extreme drought, which could prevent electrical production in developing countries, we want to do a better job at predicting precipitation and also extreme precipitation events like droughts and floods. The image on the right here, it just describes um, how single statistical learning in the past does uh, do a good job at predictions. But over time, we have found that uh, machine learning, especially neural networks, do improve models performance and accuracy. And what and so uh, the graph here shows that actually the deep neural networks do a really good job and have been some of the best um, performing models in the, in the, in the past. Sorry, guys probably didn't hear much of that. All right. No, we could hear. We could hear. You can okay, perfect. Okay. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Okay. All right. So for my methodology, I use the similar variables as the Clemson data set I uh, used to evaluate some of their baseline architectures. So for my input variables, I was using temperature, uh, specific humidity, surface pressure, insulation. Um, surface latent heat flux and surface sensible heat flux. For my target variables, I was since I was focusing on precipitation, I ended up using the precipitation uh, values that were reported from the Clemson data set. So we have the rain rate, which was reported in meters per second, the snow rate, which was reported in meters per second and happens to be the, li the liquid equivalent of the snow. And then we have total precipitation, which I created myself by adding the snow rate and the rain rate together. Uh, some pre-processing that I had to do to the data was adding the time coordinates as well as the latitude and longitude grids and I also took the daily mean of both the target and, um, and input variables so that I could reduce the size of some of the data and uh, also added that new additional variable total precipitation. I then created uh, arrays of the global data both the input and target and then I also um, created some additional uh, data sets to, to learn about some of the spatial variability. And so that spatial variability that I included was based on a map that was produced by NOAA. This uh, shows a change in precipitation predicted by the end of the 21st century, so about 2100, and is reported in inches of liquid water per year. And what I wanted to do was uh, choose some areas that were projected to see a, a strong decrease in precipitation, but also choose some areas that were um, expected to see a large increase to show if there might be any changes in um, whether or not the model performed better in, in drought events or whether it was better in, in large precipitation or flood of flooding, potential flooding events. And I also chose to make those uh, places neighboring. So that way that um, it had a little, even though the, the, the geography might be a little bit different, we have slightly uh, more similar locations than to where if I was gonna compare the Northeast of the United States to uh, China or the, you know, somewhere else across the world, it might not be as related, so. And this brings me into my um, model that I use, extreme gradient boosting, which combines a bunch of different features. We have supervised machine learning, which takes the uh, labeled input data and then uh, trains itself based over that so that it can then be tested with uh, new data that does not have any labels. Uh, then we use some decision trees. The decision trees are basically like game of 21 questions. It's gonna be asking certain questions about the different relationships between variables. And at each level, it splits into another uh, another uh, branch, which lets you know uh, whether or not the the uh, model is improving. And so it's hoping that over time, with these uh, additional layers that it's building, it's trying to learn from those and decrease its error over time. And this is kind of where the ensemble learning 
comes in and is combining all of these together to over time produce a more uh, powerful, robust, uh, robust and accurate model. And so this brings me into some of my initial results. Uh, I'm gonna start with the global the results here. We have the rain rate on the left. In the middle, we have the snow rate. And then on the right, we have total precipitation rate, which is the rain rate and the snow rate. On each graph, we have on the X axis, the actual rain rates reported in watts per meter squared. And then we have the predicted rain rates in watts per meter squared. What I did not mention in my methods was that I also converted the, uh, the meters per second rate into watts per meter squared so that it was similar to the, the, um, the units that were used in the Clemson data set, uh, data paper. And as we can see, I have the R squared and, and mean absolute errors reported here below each graph. Uh, for the rain rate, it actually did a decent job. The R squared is uh, 0.52, and R squared is going to let us know how, how good that this uh, model represents the variability in the, in the uh, actual variable. And as far as the MAE, it lets us know about how much are, or how large the errors are between the true and predicted overall. And what we can see is if we compare, uh, sorry to go through all the graphs like this, but if, we could, if you look at all the, the mean absolute errors between the three different uh, graphs, we see that the largest errors are going to be with the total precipitation. And then we have lower errors with the rain rate and snow rate. Uh, I believe this is, uh, uh, oh, let me not get into that. Then on the uh, R squared, um, we have the, uh, the highest value being the rain rate. And then for snow rate, it decreases. But then when you add them together, it, it, it drops significantly to uh, 0 0.07 for the R squared. I wanted to see how this compared to if we actually shrink the, the region down further. So I'm just going to be going over the US for this example, the Northwest and the, or sorry, Northeast and Southwest. Uh, so we have this one here. On the left, we have rain rate for the Southwest. Then we do the rain rate for the Northeast. And then I also want to compare that to the global rain rate itself because uh, uh, I only chose rain rate for this uh, portion because the snow and the total precipitation in that previous slide, they were a lot, they did perform a lot worse. So I wanted to do, just see on the one that actually was performing well, how that uh, performed just to not overwhelm me with a ton of results. And what we can see is that for the Southwest, it actually, the R squared um, decreases a, a ton, but for the Northeast, it's not, it's not terrible. It decreases a lot, but compared to that global rain rate, it is still lower. And so what I was, uh, and so, um, Basically, um, in summary, what I found was that the parallel computing function of the XGBoost and decision trees does make it easier to implement. You don't know, have to know a lot about the dimensions of the data, data or a lot of the uh, interrelationships, um, but there could be a lot more improvement for representing the variability, um, uh, but it does lend well to inclusion and with other uh, ensemble models. So a lot of other papers use this in addition to other uh, either statistical methods or models to further improve the performance of prediction. And its ability to learn from weak learners, um, again, has an ability to uh, help with, with unknown variables. So like when you saw in the previous slide here where we have um, the, the snow, snow rate, um, I believe that the reason why the snow rate was a lot lower was because there are more complicated um, processes that happen, subgrid processes that happen in relation to snow, especially with that small threshold of between freezing and liquid water that would uh, impact snow, whereas rain is maybe a little bit easier to protect just because uh, there's less, um, less of the background um, processes that are going to make it so variable. Uh, all right. And then, so for some of my next steps, I thought that it would be interesting to use the XGBoost with an ensemble um, method. And I also thought it would be good to work with smaller regions, but then um, use the information around. And so setting up a grid where the, the test uh, data is the center, but then adding a grid where you have the lag variables from all the outside variables, because that is basically the first law of geography. Um, the, the weather will be in, in one area will be impacted by the previous weather in the surrounding areas. And so if we can do that over a certain grid, you might be able to get a better information over time. And I also wanted to uh, ensure that the results could be repeated for the remaining output variables. And if uh, we could use Pearson correlation in the first place, which would have been a great idea, I might've been able to figure out if there were additional variables that I could have included or if some of the variables that I included weren't even really necessary. Thank you.
Hi, Mark. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, I just have one uh, one thing to mention. So because previously when we do the uh, meeting, you train the XGBoost using normalized data, uh, standard normalized data, and uh, it was the results was very good, were very good, and the R square was like 0. 0.7, around 0. 0.7. Uh, and somehow when you convert the unit of the presentation, I can see, especially for the total presentation, the R square is very low. Um, and I expect XGBoost to do better than 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 this. Yeah. I think it's also because of the 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 difference between the rain rate and the snow rate, because it is the liquid equivalent. The liquid equivalent of snow ends up being like multiple magnitudes lower than the rain rate. And so it's trying to predict extremely low values at the same time that it's, it's, it's trying to predict high values. And so I believe that added to some of the issues there. And so I think if we would actually, if in total precipitation, if we could maybe add some of the snow and rain as an input variable, that might help it with the prediction of total. Are there any questions online? I don't think so. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you again, Mark. And we have that meeting.